Welcome to the Wealth by Choice podcast. My name is Valerie Shira, and I'm a stay-at-home mom who turned entrepreneur. Each week, we bring you stories and wisdom from individuals who have broken the code to generating wealth. Thanks so much for being here with me today. Let's get started. All right, welcome to the Wealth by Choice podcast. Today, I have with me Jesse Dickens. Jesse has a background in cardiac sonography and is currently a director of operations for a mobile imaging company in Denver, Colorado. The journey into real estate sprouted from a desire to buy back his time and to be able to spend more time with his family. After successfully completing three flips, he decided to get into the commercial real estate space and joined a Wheelbarrow Profits mentorship program to learn the ins and outs of the industry. Since then, he's been able to be part of a... 340 plus units in, between Arizona and South Carolina. He also has is a fund manager for a short-term rental portfolio on pace to acquire 150 short-term rentals in, the, in a variety of markets across the country this year. His focus is on diversification and continually finding opportunities that match his investors' appetite. Jesse, it's great to have you on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. So, just reading through your bio, um, I wanted to mention real quick that Wheelbarrow Profits is actually how we met, and it actually kind of connected through different circles, and it's been great to be able to watch your progress and watch the things that you've been doing from a distance, and so I'm excited to have you on, but one thing that just kind of stood out to me is where you're coming from, you know, as far as, you know, your medical background and the stuff that you're doing, and then the real estate stuff, and we like to really dive into wealth and the choices that people make in order to get them to there. So let's talk about that a little bit. What, tell me a little bit more about you know your story, where you're coming from, and how you kind of started on this journey. Sure. Yeah, it's a it's a long story. I'll give you somewhat of the abbreviated version. But I finished up my initial degree uh, as a my first degree was as a music business major. I finished up with that, and I said, you know what, that was a lot of fun but what the heck am I going to do with a music degree? Took a year off, did a little bit of soul searching, knew I wanted to get into healthcare, and ended up landing on medical imaging and just kind of fell in love with medical images, whether it's CTs, MRIs, uh, or ultrasounds, and ended up landing on doing cardiac ultrasound after spending some time at a few different hospitals, shadowing, speaking to people in the field, and just kind of fell in love with, with that process. So I jumped into that, made a complete shift, 180 degrees from music to uh, science-backed medical industry, uh, and just jumped in and had to start from ground zero and was somewhat devastated to do that, to start over, but just believed in the long-term plan and really just kind of followed my heart with it. Mm -hmm. um, so got into that. I've been doing that for about seven years. I love what I do, uh, and what we have found is in the medical profession, most most people that are getting involved into real estate don't come from this place of, hey, I just hate my job. I absolutely hate my job and I just want to achieve financial freedom. It's more of, hey, I love what I do, but I also see the fallacies of just set it and forget it in the stock market mm -hmm. and I want to build something special for my family to pass on some legacy wealth. So that's kind of the pain point that my partners and I felt and uh, really kind of honed in on to jump into real estate. So that's kind of a quick uh, background of how made the jump from music to medicine to multi multifamily. Wow, yeah, okay. So, you know, starting out in music to medical, are you still are you still planning on staying in medical? Or are you eventually gonna wanna quit, get out of that and go full-time into real estate? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, yeah, I love that the name of your podcast is Wealth by Choice because Really, we have this choice every single day of how we're going to allocate our time and our resources. You know, I really truly believe that time is the most precious resource that we have. And when we talk about financial freedom, really the underlying piece of that is time freedom. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of buying back our time is, is to say, hey, I, like I said, I love what I do but I want to do it completely on my own accord. I want to work for specific cardiologists that I know, like, and trust, and I believe in their mission of patient care. And I want to do that not because my mortgage payment depends on it, 
but because I love what I do and do that the amount of time that I want to in a given week or month and side by side with the healthcare providers that I want to be next to and the patient demographic that I want to serve. So yes, I want to do real estate 100% full time, but have the ability to use my specific skill set and, and continue to do that, but have it be more for the reasons why I got into it as opposed to just because that's something that has to happen to keep food on the table. Right, right. Well, I love that. I mean, the way you say that is just exactly what, what the whole thing, Wealth by Choice, stands for. I love that. And that's, I really wanted the word choice in there because you have a choice how you show up every day. You have a choice how you're going to perform and, and, and where you're going to put your energy into. And I think a lot of times, you know, we get kind of caught up in the day-to-day -day grind and we forget we have those choices. We have those options. And we kind of, at least for me, I got put into kind of a box where I felt like, you know, these things are determined for me. The rest, you know, I, I can just choose what I do afterwards. You know, the couple hours a day that I have, those are the only ones that, you know, after work, after the kids are done with school, you know, my husband after his, his W-2 job, those are the few hours we have to choose. But that's not true. And I think a lot of people just don't realize that. And so I love that you pointed out to that. Another thing you mentioned that is really big to me is freedom. Having that freedom to be able to choose, like you said, is really what it's all about. I mean, you know, you think about it. Some people are working their whole life to have a few years of what they call retirement. You know, and that's just, that's kind of what the majority of the country, you know, that's, that's what your ultimate goal is, to retire someday and do, I don't know what, sit around the house. But the way that I'm sure you look at it, and a lot of I'm, I'm seeing a lot of entrepreneurs and investors and, and people who've really um, took the time to design their life, that's not their goal. Their goal is different, and their goal is ultimate freedom. And like you said, it's freedom to do what you want to do and, and have the choice. How much time do you want to spend? You know, in in the medical field, you know, do you want to spend a lot or a little? You know, you're covering on some amazing topics that I think a lot of people really need to hear. You uh, you had a guest on recently. I forget, I forget what her name is, but she talked about pick your heart, mm. and that phrase. Here, here's the thing: life is hard. No matter what you're doing, it's it's difficult. Raising a family, working like dealing with the stresses of family and and everything that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. But when people are afraid to jump in because they're unsure of the risks and it's just uncomfortable. Let's look at the alternatives. When I said, you know what, I am I was in my mid-30s, I said, do I want to do this for the next 30 years till I'm 65? Mm -hmm. And then really just at that point, hope that my retirement account is where it needs to be mm -hmm. by allocating a certain amount from each paycheck to go in there. I'm not planning on having any social security around when you and I get to retirement age you know if there's anything there that's great that's a bonus but to me that is so much harder than as opposed to nine to five right. I, I, I'll hit the five to nine on both sides of it mm -hmm. you know I'll wake up at five in the morning and get as much done as I can working on my business which I really love doing it's 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 kind of a passion project you know it, it doesn't feel like work I really enjoy going through the process, even though it can be rigorous and it can be monotonous at times and it can be challenging and, and heart, you know, kind of heartbreaking when you, when, you, when you put so much effort in and you don't get a deal or, or things don't go the way you want. But it's, I, I actually love doing it and it's a, it, there's a lot of fuel behind that. So uh, to me, that quote unquote hard is totally worth it. When I look at like the scale and balancing both sides, I don't know how old your kids are, but when I look at our uh, our three-year-old and hopefully another one on the way at some point, the sacrifices we make today to be there when they are five, 10, 15 years old is so worth it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a very visual person. We live right by the middle school that, that our, uh, our child will go to. And I drive by the baseball field every single day. And I just visualize being being the coach for the team mm -hmm. and being that super dad that is almost obnoxiously at every single practice, at every single recital, just there for everything because I have the ability mm -hmm. to. Right now, I, I don't, um, and, and it's a challenge, but I'm willing to make those sacrifices today 
to reap the benefits of that, you know, years down the line. Mm -hmm. Very true. You know, it makes me think of something I told uh, my husband Jonathan the other day. I said, you know, when I when I study people who are where I want to be, you know, whether that's one step or 20 steps ahead of me, I mean, even from just somebody who's slightly above me to all the way to like Elon Musk, and you talk about these people who are high achievers and who are, you know, like I said, you know, way out in front, there's one word that really comes to my mind, and it's discipline. They're very disciplined people, and that really goes to what you're saying. Choose your heart. You know, it's hard to say, I'm not going to eat that. But it's harder to live in a body where you eat anything you want, any time you want. So, you know, even, you know, it's, it's hard to get out of, the mo out of bed in the morning. But it's harder when you didn't accomplish your things and now you're behind. So you're right on. Pick your heart. And, and it makes me really admire those in front of me because they've really mastered the ability to be disciplined. And... One thing that I noticed is, for me, you know, in, in building that is, is taking small steps. And I don't know, I'd love to hear your thought on discipline and maybe some things that you've kind of mastered in your life. But for me, it's been taking little steps and, and, and until they're kind of solid and then taking the next one and not trying to bite off too much because then it's like when I try and completely change my world overnight, a lot of times I don't stick to it. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that it's, it's, a, it's a huge piece of the puzzle. And coming from the W-2 world, where I've typically been working in hospitals, it's very much in the box. I walk into the facility, I clock in, my schedule is there, my patients are here, my equipment, it's, you know, it's very regimented. Mm -hmm. Jumping into the entrepreneurship adventure, there is no box. Right. You create, it's an octagon, right. and you, you create it, you know, and it morphs and it changes, and uh, it no day is the same mm -hmm. and because of that it's been a huge shift of trying to adapt the way that I operate to to fit and meet the challenges that come up mm -hmm. and that are required to, to be handled so the number one thing for me and, and I'll be honest that's been a challenge mm -hmm. it's absolutely been a challenge because there's no one that's quote unquote holding you accountable. Exactly. You have to be the one when that alarm goes off at five in the morning. What what's your choice? Mm -hmm. Snooze or or growth. Mm -hmm. And the number one thing that I have found to help to help me with that discipline piece is the accountability. Mm -hmm. And that's why you know when we talk about uh, membership into a community. For us, it was Jake and Gino or the MIH Mastermind. It's being around, just like you said, the people that are that are doing what you want to do, whether that's people that just started doing it six months prior to you or people that have been in it for decades and that they can show you. It, it you know, There really hasn't been a holier-than-thou kind of uh, feeling that I've that I've experienced when I got into this and it's people that have been willing to take the time and show me really out of the kindness of their heart mm -hmm. hey this is what we are currently doing this is what we have done we're we're on, we're still on this journey here come walk with us shoulder to shoulder as we continue to grow and that's been incredible and that has pushed me so far beyond my comfort level and I feel like there's almost this innate uh, responsibility for when people come in and join those memberships after me for me to say hey what can I help you with you know uh, one of my favorite books is The Go-Giver by Bob Berg and he just talks about it's not about there's so many go-getters out there and it's not about people that are that are hungry and uh, and that are just willing to to get up and work hard and and put in the hours but it's about it's about really trying to, to bring people with you and what can you, how can you serve, mm -hmm. you know? Seek to serve and that's really how ultimate growth is going to take place. So it's being around people that have that mind. It, this is all mindset. Mm -hmm. Anyone can do what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Anyone can do it. You don't need to have a bunch of money. You don't need to have a bunch of experience. You don't need to have all the time in the world. You don't need to be that smart. It helps to have any combination of those things, but people are successful starting with absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's really powerful to see and be around. So it, it really just comes down to the mindset because we hold ourselves back by limiting beliefs. And I am absolutely a culprit of that. So it's being around the right kind of people that can pull you out of that when they see you get in it. So that's, that's my experience with it. I'd love to hear your take on it too. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Uh, the people you surround yourself with, are it, it's everything. And I had no idea until we got into, we actually started with the uh, Wilbo Prophets, the Jake and G Gino community, and later NIH. And then, you know, branching out and getting into other groups and starting to actually develop those relationships. And love my family, love my friends, you know, but a lot of them, you know, some of them are on a similar journey. Some of them are not. And that was all that we knew. And so, you know, when I look back now, I can see that's why we were where we were. We were capped out by our network. We were, we were as high as our network was. And so when I look back and I'm like, it, it, it seems silly now when I look back, but at the point I didn't know it. But, I, you know, I'd say to my husband recently, I was like, why was I taking advice from somebody I wouldn't want to be like? Like, it's so dumb. But yet when you're there, you don't realize that's what you're doing. Like, you know, for example, somebody, you know, who isn't able to get out of rat race, so to say, you know, but they're always, they're always, when they stop, their business is done. That's a perfect example of somebody that we, you know, we were trying to get advice from and trying to learn from. Instead of looking beyond that and saying, I don't really want that the rest of my life. I want somebody beyond that. I need to build friends and get advice from those people. And I think of the, um, the book, uh, Richest Man Babylon. You know, he talks about mm -hmm. not taking advice, you know, not giving your money to somebody who's, that's not even their profession. And so that's kind of what we, we were doing in the past. Um, something you mentioned as far as, you know, being a go-giver you know, you, you were in the, you did the underwriting pod for a long time. Are you still doing it or did you stop doing that? You were in that for a long time. That's a perfect example of being a go-giver. Tell me about that and how, how did that help you or how did that turn out? Yeah. So that started from the frustrations around underwriting. When we first got started, I'm not a spreadsheet guy. Uh -huh. So when we were looking at these underwriting platforms and trying to put together deals and it was just, it was hard mm -hmm. and it's that's never been my skill set so a couple of us we had an accountability pod and we all just decided to practice together so we would take the same set of financials on a deal whether it was a live deal or just kind of a practice deal and we would all underwrite it individually and we would come together and look for the differences and the discrepancies and then and then work through it and then reach out to our coaches and try to find like it wasn't about who's right or who's wrong, but like how, how can we learn how to do this effectively and efficiently? And it was really a, a powerful exercise to do with a group. So then we invited a couple other people. We, we told a couple of people about it, and then we put up a post on the, uh, the Jake and Gino Facebook page, and it just opened up the floodgates. And, you know, within a couple of calls, we had 40 people on the call, and it just built up some momentum and uh, and it was just really, really powerful. And it was, I think the coolest thing about it was to watch someone come in that was eager and willing to get really out of your comfort zone and present a deal that they have underwritten mm -hmm. in front of a group of potentially 40, 50 other investors who are probably ahead of them mm -hmm. and have people essentially pick apart their underwriting and show them the areas that they probably made mistakes in. And to watch people come in and do that and be scared and timid to do it and have really no idea what they're doing, but be willing to put in the work mm -hmm. and and then see that same person close the deal six months later mm -hmm. and then come back on the underwriting pod and share about that win and, and show that deal. Mm -hmm. And to watch that come full circle multiple times to watch several individuals have that experience and just to build community that way has been has been so incredible mm -hmm. uh and now that we live in this uh this world of mo most of my connections are through zoom so i feel like i know some people very well through multiple zoom calls and then we finally get to meet up at a conference maybe years after we've since we've known each other right. uh and then actually get to have some like human actual human <laughs> connection it's just it, it's been it's been really refreshing to to see that. So yes, I'm I'm no longer a part of it. I just have not had the time to to really give it the attention and the um, that that it requires. Um, but it was a, a very very special thing that that um, it, it you know it was it was really helpful for me just to to see that and it was it was motivational mm -hmm. to say hey. It, again, anyone can do this 
it's a matter of the choices that you're willing to make today. Yeah, yeah. And I love, I mean, you've seen a need. I mean, you had the need. You had the need yourself, you know, and, and to be able to see that, you know, I can involve others and be a go-giver and open this up for other people to benefit, you know, in the end, I'm sure it benefits you a great deal as well. So it's like having that mindset of serving other people and helping other people and including them, you know, in the end, you always win. I mean, I feel like... You can give out, and you may not get back the exact way that you gave out, but you will get back. I, I truly believe that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I've watched that. It's, I don't remember. It's, it seems like it's been years that it's, it's gone on, but it's it's been a pretty cool pod that we've attended ourselves, and, and we've been able to watch some pretty cool things happen there. So that's kind of awesome. Yeah. But I'm curious through your bio, the STR Fund. I didn't even realize you were doing that. Tell me about that. I'm, I'm really interested to hear more, you know, what you're kind of doing, what your plan is with that. Sure. So we've been multifamily since 2019. That has been what we've been focused on, what we've purchased, what we have really dialed in our systems as far as operations, management, value add. And over the past six months or so, it's been very difficult to to make deals pencil. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've missed out on a lot of opportunities by a small margin. And it just kind of goes back to the fundamentals of underwriting and and being able to draw a line and say this is where it makes sense mm -hmm. with you know with being as conservative as we feel comfortable being sure. and we're just not willing to because you can always you can always fudge the the calculations just a little bit yep. if you're so close and you just want to make it work you can you can make any deal look good on paper mm -hmm. and uh, you know over the past probably five years or so even if you stretched a little bit, the the market probably would would save you and would would be able to cover those deficiencies mm -hmm. especially where we're at right now in the economy we've we've tightened up even more as far as what our projections are um, and our assumptions moving forward so it's been difficult for us to find deals in the in the markets that we've been looking in so because of that we've been open to other opportunities and I met uh, a group in at uh, at a conference months back and it's a short-term rental fund buying properties all over the country they did the exact same fund last year and the way that they've been able to build everything vertically integrated and not have a third-party property management mm -hmm. not outsource the underwriting or the acquisition side or the data set everything is in-house and just after after having some conversations we realized that as far as a missions-based company, our, our values and goals were very much in line with theirs and the way that they conduct themselves. Because it, this, as you know, this goes so much deeper than just finding a deal that makes sense. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at a partnership, you're getting into a, essentially a business marriage right. and you're, right. you're linking up with, with a, someone or a group for an extended period of time. And we need to know that when times get tough, like how are you going to act mm -hmm. as far as in, you know investor relations, as far as the way that you handle the balance between business and your personal life when stuff is not going well with your family, like how, how is your work going to be affected by that? And there's no way to ever know every single answer, but you can really do some due diligence and just find out, do we really connect um, on a level that's a little bit deeper than just trying to do this deal? Right. Could we see ourselves working with this group for the next five, ten years? Mm -hmm. And we found a group that we really that we, that checked all those boxes, and the, the the deal itself, the fund, the project checked all the boxes as well. Um, and and you're involved in short term rentals, and and you so you I know you know all the nuances of that, and having multiple exit strategies and just different ways to really lower your expenses and really maximize. And it's really about standing out. So with multifamily, you've got this basic human need of housing. And that, and we love it. And we think that that over the next decade will continue. The undersupply of, of affordable housing is not going anywhere. That's not an overnight fix. Um, we're in some crazy volatility really just because of interest rates. And that's what's causing this turmoil in the banking system and just the overall economy and inflation. Like, the, the Federal Reserve is in a very tough spot. Uh, I haven't agreed with a lot of the stuff that they've done, but I'll give them credit that like right now they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. But we still believe 
that multifamily long term is a great place to be, and then we're, and we're not leaving there at all. But with short term rentals being more of a that's a you know that's more of a destination, a vacation type thing. Those are things that as an economy pulls back, we're very mindful and aware of how that can affect it. But it's also about just being better than your competition mm -hmm. because people that are looking to rent a place on Airbnb or VRBO, they have choices. Right. And you have to find a way to, to make yourself be different than everyone else. And we found a group that is just, is really, really strategic and really, um, just really good at what they do. Mm -hmm. So we, we found a group that we weren't even looking for just from attending a conference and just having conversations uh, that aligns with everything that, that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we jumped on board and, uh, and are, are happy to be part of the team. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you're right on as far as, you know, being better than the competition. You know, we don't travel a whole lot, you, you know, using Airbnbs, but when we do travel, we usually use an Airbnb. And there's not very many good ones. And I'm, I am a little picky. When I go somewhere, I want to stay somewhere nice. And so when I when I go, especially we've gone to Florida, you know, I, I tell my husband, I'm like, I'm not going to stay there. I mean, it just it looks worse than my house. And, and you know, I, it's not like we live in some big great thing. But like when you go on vacation, you want to stay somewhere nice. There's not a ton of them. There's a ton of Airbnbs, but not a ton of high quality ones. And so that really does set you apart. And it allows you to, to float when the market does change and shift. It's the bottom level ones that are going to be just wiped aside, the ones who don't have their processes, don't have their quality, don't have great ratings, and don't have the amenities that people want and are looking for. So, yeah, that's right on. That's awesome. Um, as yeah. far as the meeting your partner, that's it's funny. That's almost, that's pretty much exactly what happened with me and Alex and uh, the Streamline team with our virtual assistant agency that we have. So we got on to network about real estate and we ended up talking about VAs and virtual assistants and, and that's kind of how we formed our partnership. So yeah, I can relate to the, weren't even looking and it just kind of kind of hit you. So that's exciting. Yeah, I, uh, I got to hang out with Alex in Louisville at a conference a couple months back and he's just such a such a great guy. I think you guys are, are a, a powerful duo with what you guys are doing. Yeah, yeah, we're really grateful to know them for sure. Well, Jesse, what, what are some things you're working on this year or anything you're studying, learning? What's kind of going on this year for you? You know, you've got the short-term rental uh, fund. Anything else? So we're still looking at properties. We actually have a signed LOI on a uh, about a 75-unit deal in Arizona. Awesome. That's very close to a couple other properties that we have there. We're so now we're in the transition phase from LOI to PSA, yeah. and and there's some there's some blockage there. So we're hoping we can work through it. Uh, so still looking to grow and develop in the markets that we're in. We're always open for additional partnerships. We're we're really trying to provide diversity in the assets that we're we're providing to our investor mm -hmm. database. So uh, as healthcare professionals, we have we have built a platform to help educate other healthcare providers on commercial real estate or STRs and, uh, and, and give them opportunities that they can get involved in. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to create some diversity in what we're putting forward in front of them. For us, multifamily is our bread and butter, STRs are the, the new path that we're going in, but we also want to provide a bunch of different options as long as we can find operators that really, again, align with our missions mm -hmm. uh, and, and can create you know, fantastic returns. So that's what our, our focus is. The fund will be open through the course of the entire year. So a lot of effort is going to be continually put into that as opposed to a straight syndication where you have 60 days before closing, everything goes into it and you, know, you get to that closing point and then the operations start. So with the fund, it'll be a lot of uh, time that we're putting in over the course of the year. We've been kind of slow and strategic over the past couple of years. We haven't gone out and bought five, six properties a year. We've closed uh, five properties in a three-year span uh, and just kind of taken baby steps and made sure that we're able to, especially on a value-add deal, mm -hmm. do things the right way and not just close and say, okay, we're on to the next one. Say, hey, this first six months is vital right. on the performance of this property. So we've really tried to nurture that and put everything we have into making sure that it really gets off on the right foot. So, um, yeah, we've. It's just going to kind of be more of the same on the on the stuff that we're looking at and, and the opportunities that we're trying to present. 
Yeah, I like that. And I like the fact that you're diversifying in the I mean, some people say do, some people don't. But I, I like the fact because if one asset class isn't doing well, you know, you've kind of got your money spread a little bit through different ones. And, and you touched on something that's key, the operator. You know, people think they're investing in the building. But in all reality, the building means nothing if the operator's yep. bad. You know, I mean, I, we we recommend investing in the operator and trusting that they'll perform, you know, not that you don't look at the underwriting, not that you don't look in, in the market, but first off, we want to know the operator. What's their track record? What are their values? What are their, like you said, what are they going to do when times get tough or when things change? How do they react? You know, all those big things. That's the first thing we like to look at. And then after that, you know, what market, what building and all that kind of stuff. So I like that you touched on that. Are there yeah, any... absolutely. That's, oh, go ahead. that's, it, that's so much more important than the property itself. Right. Obviously, you, you do, just like you said, you need to assess the property, the market, the submarket, the demographics there. But this is really about the sponsorship team. I like to invest as an LP as well and have other people do the work and enjoy the, the benefits of that. Mm -hmm. And it's really about finding the team that you can trust in, in every decision that they make. So on the multifamily side, we, we are the operators, but on the, these other, that's where, because as far as diversification goes, we didn't want, we wanted to kind of stay in our lane and say, hey, we do one thing and we do one thing really well. But as we are on the deals that we are not the main operators on, mm -hmm. as long as we can find people that are the, the experts in that space, that's, that's what we want to present to our investors exactly. and say, hey, you're either investing with us because we are operating these deals ourselves and we've built that know, like, and trust relationship, or we have found an operator that we are going to invest with, mm -hmm. with our own capital. And if you would like to join us, feel free to come along. Right. So, yeah, it, because I think as far as if you're an operator that says, hey, I do multifamily, I'm going to get into it operating self-storage, right. and then I'm going to do SCRs, and then I'm going to do some mobile home parks, and then I'm going to do a little bit of crypto. Red flag. <laughs> that's that's something to me that, yes, is a red flag, and, and you really want to find the experts in the in the space. Exactly. I love that you clarified that because that's something that could easily be missed and missed, and you want to be aware. if you're Especially if you're an LP and you're not on the operating side, you want to look at the, you know, who is on the operating side and who's going to run the show, you know, are they an expert in that specific niche? And, and that's a really good point. But as we kind of come to the, come to the, come to the end, are there any books or anything that you've read or anything that really has stood out to you, whether it's in real estate or just personal development that you would highly recommend? Sure. And I think it really depends on the stage that an investor is at. Uh, I usually gear more towards what was so vitally important for me in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I, so like probably every other guest that you've had, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, got me into the entrepreneurial and real estate game. Right. That book, complete, it, it changed my life. Like I can legitimately say that. It completely changed my perception of how the world works essentially and how, and how finances work, but in a very kind of general sense. And then the cash flow quadrant and understanding how we earn income. Mm -hmm whether that's with a W-2 job, as a, a side gig 1099, as a business owner, or as an investor, to understand the different buckets and understanding that some buckets should be probably weighted a little bit heavier than others. There's nothing wrong with having W-2 income. I, you know, I, I think I will probably have W-2 income for an extended period of time because fortunately I, I do enjoy what I do, but to understand that trying to move take that as a stream of income and just funnel that into business and investing uh, forms of income and additional streams. That was that was huge. So I think that that's a big one. For mindset, I had mentioned The Go-Giver. I, I think that regardless of what you're doing, I think that is a great book, a very easy read that can really apply some some uh, perspective shifts that can, can really unlock a thing, unlock a lot of things for for investors, so I would I'd recommend those. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And you know, you mentioned you know as far as like the Robert Kiyosaki books and and the whole entrepreneurial thing. I like to point out that not everyone sh would make a good entrepreneur, and not everybody should be. You can't all be the entrepreneur, and it's not for everyone. And sometimes I think 
the entrepreneurial world makes those who aren't or who are in a W-2 world feel like they should be somewhere else. And that's not always the case. You know what I mean? Not everyone is cut for that. And it doesn't mean that if you are, you're better or you're, it's just different. They're completely different. I mean, you can be highly successful in a W-2 world as long as you understand some of these principles that we kind of like we've talked about. They're, they're the same in both worlds. They're just completely different, you know, as far as, you know, working for yourself or working for somebody else. You can still grow and expand and learn and, and take that income that you're just increasing and put it into real estate you know so i always like to point that out because not everyone is cut out to be an entrepreneur yeah absolutely and i think especially when you if you get on social media if you get on linkedin facebook instagram and you're following people that are involved in real estate you're going to see a lot of big wins mm -hmm. you're going to see the closing posts you're going to see the the bank account posts the the tax return posts and we, we show, we, we do want to highlight and show that stuff, but there's so much behind the scenes mm -hmm. that does not get posted on those sites. Exactly. And that's the stuff that you will not know until you get into it. And just like you said, not everyone is cut out for that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I, I'll just share a quick story. I know we're at the end, but our first property that we purchased uh, in Tucson, Arizona, 24 unit complex, within the first two months, we had a stabbing on the property. Oh we had a death on the property right next door, completely unrelated to the stabbing. We had a mold that showed up that was not we didn't know about in the inspection. We had bed bugs uh, and obviously the pandemic that was going on. And then we had the uh, eviction moratorium that showed up all within the first two months. And my first thought was, what have I done? <laughs> What have I gotten ourselves into? And this might have been the biggest mistake ever. Mm -hmm. I believe it. Those, those challenges, I feel like, in a sense, hardened me up a little bit mm -hmm. and gave me some experiences with real estate, some challenges right off the bat that have really helped me. Mm -hmm. And the, the biggest thing is to stay in the game. Yeah. You know, but you're right. Not everyone is... You, especially if you're adding this on to a W-2 job and just say, hey, I'm still going to work full-time. I'm still going to raise a family. I'm just going to start up a business on the side. It's not, it's, it, there's nothing easy about it. Mm -hmm. Passive income is not super passive if you're on the active side. Right. We have to understand that. It's passive if you're an LP, but if you're a GP, there's really nothing passive about it. So um, I guess I, just for the listeners who are thinking about jumping in, I would just have conversations with people that have been in your shoes and done that before. It's just important to, to do that, to have a better idea of what you're, what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. Yeah. And I think of the, um, Gunderson books, um, you know, he talks about like killing sacred, the killing sacred cows books. I think he talks a lot about just being able to add value. That's really what it boils down to. I mean, if you can do that in a W2 place where you can be a high income earner, I'd almost say just do that. I mean, that you know, you can go to work and get paid. You know, that's great. And take that money and put it into real estate. Put it into, you know, some type of investing. But if you're cut out and you just you can't stop the fire within you and you just, you know, you have that entrepreneurial drive, go for that. It just both of them, they really boil down to can you add value? And as you increase your ability to add value to others, your pay will increase. You know, whether that's for your boss or, you know, maybe you find a better job. Maybe you are at a a dead end job, but as you you know take classes, you learn, you up your skills, you know you can find a different job that you have room to grow and, and increase that income, and that's something else. I mean, I feel like we could go on forever because this is such a great conversation. <laughs> but it, you know, not focusing on. I used to be a coupon cutter. Like we're talking about saving twenty five cents boggles my mind. I mean, it's it's so ridiculous. I mean, forget the twenty five cents. Go make ten more dollars. You know, I mean, how silly. But. Yeah. You know, the 25 minutes it took you to exactly, save that 25 cents, your time is worth more print, than that. And the ink was probably 50 cents to print it out of the printer. You know, I mean, it's just that whole mindset of cutting <laughs> back and, and conserving versus how can I be more valuable, whether it's in the W-2 yep. or whether it's in an entrepreneurial world, the, the basic principle is the same. How can you add more value? And, and, and yeah, I'm kind of get me fired because this is a soapbox of mine. And I feel like, you know, some people maybe feel could feel um, uh, maybe not put down, but like if you're not an entrepreneur, you're not as good as somebody who is. And that's just not true. 
it boils down to how can you add value to others. And I love that you've kind of pointed that out and I hope the listeners can really be encouraged either side. It boils down to how much value you can add. Don't ever get off that soapbox. <laughs> get up there and shout it. <laughs> oh, funny, funny. Well, hey, this has been just phenomenal. I love these conversations, especially when it deals with mindset and choice because that's just what I'm really passionate about. And I appreciate, Jesse, that you hopped on with us today and that you shared a lot of your experience and the struggles you've gone through, the stuff that you've learned. I really appreciate that. Um, if the listeners would like to get a hold of you, what's a good way to get in contact with you? Sure. Just reach out. My email is jesse at wealthcarecap.com. Dot com. Uh, Jesse is, there's no I, J-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. um, and that's, that's the best way. I would love to connect and help out any way that I can. And I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, super grateful that you gave me the chance to come on here and chat. And I'm so glad that we got to connect after years of quote unquote knowing each other right, right. and now finally getting to connect. Let, and let's, let's make a, a pact here to stay connected, okay? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jesse. You have a great week. Thank you for joining us today. I'm so grateful that you took the time to invest in yourself and to learn with me today. If you're interested in joining a group of like-minded people, I want to personally invite you to our free networking group where you can make connections and build relationships with people who are working together to generate wealth. Just click the link that is included in the show notes and I hope to see you there.